a lot of us don't trust ourselves because we haven't spent much time being ourselves. Like, sure. So even this, the most empowering part of adapting something is over time, not overnight, but rebuilding that trust that you actually, you can find your way through this. And it might not look like the way your friend is doing this, the work, but you're doing it and you're trusting the way you're doing the work. Because mm. I get so many questions and I get it. People asking me exactly how. What are the one, two, three, write the directions down. And I can't because my direction for whatever it is that we're talking about right. might not be exactly right. what your direction should be right. for you. So the beautiful part is learning sure. to connect with yourself and learning your way yep. through yeah. whatever it is, the heart and the healing. I believe that each and every one of us has the power within ourselves to create the life that we really want. And I want to help give you the tools to make that happen. I'm Danica Patrick, and I'm pretty intense. On the show today is Nicole LaPera. She goes by the holistic psychologist on Instagram. This, this woman has such wisdom and experience and knowledge about things that we face. And so, um, so I've been following her for a long time and, you know, she's very good at explaining and inspiring you to deepen the relationship with yourself, to learn about yourself, to understand why you react to certain things, why certain people would react to you then, of course, too, and how to understand how to navigate from this really present place when it comes to life and the challenges, whether it be a relationship, um, perhaps it's a family dynamic, which she talks a lot about because that's very present in her life. But with Nicole, it's all about the self. And so she has this beautiful program that she does, um, which is a future self journaling. And so for anybody that follows her on Instagram, you'll see a ton of that in her stories and with her followers. It's a way to create the life that you really want. And of course that resonates with me deeply because that's in the intro. I really hope that you take as much as I did from this episode. She is a really, really wise woman. So enjoy the show. Nicole, you, you just seem to hit it on the head. Whenever you post something, it's like, yeah. And I, I, you have a superpower. You realize that? I appreciate you saying that. Um, <laughs> I'm hearing, hearing more and more of that. But I think part of it is the relatability. You know, when I talk about my story, I think there's a lot of, I, I joke and I say I'm the universal, the universal human in a lot of ways. So some of it is just me talking about my story that I think is pretty universally relatable to a lot of us. Uh, a lot of it is hanging out in the comments. I'm really into my community mm. that we've built over at the Instagram page. So I'm really engaged. And when I say hanging out in my comments, I, that's, that's like a kind of a data collection site for me. So you it's mean really literally in the comments of the Instagram? Quite literally yeah. just being in my comments, seeing pe how people, how the collective is responding to whatever I'm posting that mm -hmm. helps continue to direct me because while like I was saying earlier, some, some of my healing journey is a bit universal. Not all of it is. So yeah. I can see the holes and I can see where people are struggling, maybe in ways that I didn't struggle right. by what's coming out in the comments. And then I'll use that as the platform to continue to create more I was actually going to ask you. So I have a pulse kind of huh. all the while. So I know me. I know the people that I, you know, are in my personal life and what mm -hmm. they struggled with, with their healing journeys. Or like my clients as well were really great learning ground for me, but I have mm. a pulse on the collective. I Smart. Mean, the size of the account. So there's so much of the time that when you start to get really popular as you have your Instagram account has like 1.7 million followers mm -hmm. and you've had it for like a year and a half, which is amazing, which just shows how much it resonates with people. Mm -hmm. um, but you hear a lot of people like, oh, don't read the comments, you know, because there's so many opinions that's, out there, but it is, but you're finding the value in it mm -hmm. and the pulse and the heartbeat of where people are at. Cause I was going to ask you, what drives your content? Yeah. Yeah. Just noticing where people are at, observing. I mean, I did, I did individual client work for quite some time, both in, I call it like the old, the old modality of the talk therapy. So yeah. I had a sense, I think of the places and the ways people were stuck. That's kind of, I break my, my professional life into two separate journeys. So I think the journey when I was just doing the talk therapy, myself included, I mean, I've been in talk therapy, I've been on medication. Um, that I think gave me a large awareness. And that's, that was a really big impetus for mm -hmm. why I shifted my work in general, mm -hmm. because I kept coming 
up against stuck and stuckness. And even with myself, like I felt like I was insightful. I maybe knew what I had to do differently to get the results in my life that I wanted, whatever they may or may not be, but yet I couldn't. And then years hmm. of seeing individual clients coming in for talk therapy, very similar to the methods that I was using, that was a theme. Everyone was stuck. Hmm. Even the most insightful, you know, people, we would have great sessions where, you know, we would have an insight and we would so get something, maybe even know where it connected to in our past for this client, come up with a game plan. And then yet I would come in the next week with a report of that was all great, but my life still looks the same. I'm still in my negative habits and my pattern. So that was a really big kind of wake up point for me in general. So when you say talk therapy, so everybody understands... Um, explain what you mean by talk therapy yeah, or absolutely. all of the different facets of talk yeah, therapy. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, historically, and this is the way that I was trained. So you are historically, let me back up even further, the model of mental illness. Um, I like to profess a model of mental wellness because I do believe that we can all achieve wellness, but mm -hmm. old paradigm and is asking really, for what you want, not what you don't want. Yeah, we I don't mean, want illness, so let's not say there's it. There's just so much <laughs> empowerment that I think the shift can happen, but I think that there's two two worlds. There's the old world where it was very much that deficit model, that like genetic, if I have that chip or if I don't have that chip, I do have a deficit. And that might be a physical illness, a mental illness, you know, whatever it is that I'm struggling with, mm -hmm. there's a cause that can't be changed. So we're having a conversation about management, right? How do I give myself a life that's mm. within these already decided upon parameters, mm. whatever my genes are, in, you know, right, exactly. So I can only get so well and I can only, you know, get so sick. So that's, and I just didn't believe that to be true. But with that, said the models then were talk therapy where you can come in you get a great therapist and i'm by no means i still think that there's a place and a need to have supportive individuals mm -hmm. whether or not they're mm -hmm. in the form of a therapist or a best friend so this when i talk about this i'm not talking down on talk therapy or support i think that's necessary mm -hmm. but in the old model our options to manage right this deficit whatever it was was talking so you get a therapist you come in every week um, and you explore, you explore your feelings. Some of it is yeah. CBT, you change your thoughts, et cetera. And then the other option was medication. So because you have this genetic deficit, we can boost you know, or, or enhance the therapy with medication. And those two often go hand in hand. So that's, as a therapist, that's what I was doing. And you have a degree in psychology, right? I have a degree in clinical psychology. So, and everything that I was taught along the way was leading me down that path of, you have a, and this is what I wanted. I mean, I should mention that too. I wanted to yeah. be a therapist. I yeah. wanted to hang my yeah. shingle. I wanted to have a practice. I love people. I love understanding them. I love, you know, having connections with them. So that's what I was very much interested in doing. Mm -hmm. I got my PhD in clinical psychology, which would allow me to do that. And the methods that we were taught, we were not taught anything of the medication that's in the psychiatry realm, but we were taught all of the ways that we could provide talk therapy in that supportive environment. Yeah. So flat, fa fast forward, I have the practice week after week, I'm clocking hours. In my personal life, I too am struggling with anxiety for as long as I can remember. I'm on the medication. I was in pretty intensive therapy at different points along the way. So I was doing the same thing. Past that, tense, right? Oh, past tense, mm -hmm. past tense. That I was that I was offering to to clients, and then it took my own what I call my own dark night of the soul, my own you know, physical, spiritual, emotional meltdown, breakdown. Mm. That first and foremost scared me. Um, mm -hmm. I thought because of some of the physical symptoms that I was having, I thought that I had something physically wrong with me. Mm -hmm. So in as we all love to do, we dive on the research, sure. on the Google research. I must be allergic to this food. Yes, I gotta go gluten free. Uh, it was a little bit scarier what I was coming up with. Where was your, where was it hitting you physically? Where were you manifesting? So my whole life I've Let's had- Let's just talk about dark night of soul. I have so many other yeah. questions like pushing on them, <laughs> but I think we can just get dive deeper now. Uh, just cause I think it's, that's the relatable part yeah. is that people, people get these symptoms. They have physical mm -hmm. manifestations. I've had them. Um, it's not like it happens every week, but it can happen. Actually, every day there can be yes. pings. I would call them like a ping mm -hmm. where you feel it in your heart, you feel it in your gut, you know, um, there's an awareness in your mind, something like that. But then there's the bigger ones, which have happened a few times, which is like where you can't eat, yeah. where you are unwell. Yes. Um, so, um, so let's, yeah. I mean, if you're willing to share the of dark course. night of the soul, yeah. I, you know, I think that it, this could be a really helpful story for people. Yeah, 100%. And I agree. I think that a lot of the symptoms or the issues that we're struggling with sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes to a catastrophic 
degree where we're we can't work anymore or you know things are actually breaking down Mm. i believe i mean what holistic means to me i call myself the holistic psychologist what that means to me is yes the mind the body and the soul are all connected but also i think what it means to me is that there's a driving like when something's in balance when the symptoms are there like i said whether they're the daily pings that you're talking Mm. about or the big catastrophes that happen i believe at least they don't come from anywhere they're related to the system specifically probably a deeper imbalance in Mm -hmm. one of those systems in our body in Mm -hmm. our physiology a lot of us have unbalanced physiology or dysregulated nervous systems that cause our symptoms whether they're in our minds we're living maybe too much in our mind we're living by i call them narratives older stories that aren't serving us anymore and i believe we have a soul so what an imbalance in one or all of those systems can cause those those symptoms so for me As long as I can remember, I've always had kind of digestive stuff going on, never really just a clean digestive system. So that's been one that I think I can trace back from birth. Oh, wow. From birth. As long as you can remember. I've never not. Literally as long as you can remember. Quite literally. Not like as as an adult, but your whole life. Yeah. And interestingly enough, my whole family system more or less had similar digestive issues. So here's even more, right? Old model. Oh, well, the why is because genetically I was gifted with this digestive problem. Or I've come to know the why now is, is that we're all living in a in a system that maybe isn't the most balanced. So we were all showing the same symptom of gastro, you know, disturbances or whatever you want to call them, but it wasn't genetically connected as I once thought. It was because of those imbalances. So that's been as long as I can remember mind's anxiety. So it's in the stomach, the clenching, Mm -hmm. the panic attacks. I mean, panic attacks are a symptom of an underlying imbalance. So that was pretty much the digest of my whole life. In my 20s, I would say my panic attacks really started to reach an all-time high, My probably the whole decade of my 20s. Can you explain a panic attack to me? Absolutely. So, I mean, a panic attack essentially feels like a heart attack for a lot of us. Some of us go, I almost took, even though I know, knew about panic attacks, I was so convinced that this was definitely not the panic attack that feels like a heart attack. It must have been the heart attack. So it feels sometimes like shortness of breath, constriction. Sometimes we get hot. We might faint. Our heart is pounding. What's the circumstance? Is there a circumstance uh, or any time anywhere? Really, it can be anything. Some of us have anxieties connected to a thing. I'm mm-hmm. afraid of flying, right? So a when I fly, mm-hmm. are you afraid? Of no, oh, okay. no. But I know people that are afraid of <laughs> it. And they'll take so. Xanax and they'll, Absolutely. you know, they're mm-hmm. very, they'll need to drink. Yeah. Yeah. But I used to have a, a low grade, not to the extent that I've heard some people have flight anxiety, but so it can be attached to something specific, like flying, like heights. And sure. then in those circumstances, I might have this panic attack, mm-hmm. but it can also not be. So my, the, the panic attacks I started having maybe weren't necessarily connected to anything in my external environment. It was just mm. dysregulation. And they started for me at a period of time where my mom was, go, who was been chronically ill pretty much my whole life, but she was starting to have some serious heart issues. So a lot of my anxiety was, so sometimes it's more internal. Right? So I had something to worry about that was health related. Huh. That tended to be the the look of my anxiety to begin with. So then I started to have panic, the more acute, you know, kind of, if we think of anxiety, I think about it like a, um, kind of like a mountain, right? And the panic is like the tip of it. We can have low grade anxiety and never peak up into mm-hmm. that panic. Some people will never have a panic mm-hmm. attack, but some hmm. will, but it feels like a heart attack. And it's a very physiological, visceral experience. Like your body is actually going through something. It's yeah. Like, and you can see it. Yeah. If someone's around you, they might even look white. You might even look giving like you, Giving you signs and symptoms. Yeah. And that's a beautiful Something's example of the connection between the mind and the body. Yeah, it's so So beneficial. for me, right, if this was my mom, my mom nervous about my mom, my mom and her anxiety, and then my body is having this whole full-blown yeah. reaction. So what was it like growing up for you? In, in just you grew in up in general. Philadelphia, right? I grew right? up in Philadelphia. And you just moved to Venice. And I just Congrats. moved to Venice, I just, which is actually part of my whole evolution story. Um, but so f- growing up for me, anxiety is all I knew. My, I have a very interest, a more interesting family uh, circumstance because my brother and my sister are 15 and 18 years older than me. Wow. So I was born to older parents yeah. and I'm 37. So I was born in 82. So when my, my mom found out she was pregnant with me, it was... It was concerning because she was 42. And in 82, I don't know where exactly the same huh. age. When's your birthday then? September. Okay, mine's in March. 15th. Oh, 
So it was, I, I say that because I think generationally yeah. things have evolved and now, you know, later 30s women, early 40s women, we kind of understand that, yeah, there may be higher mm -hmm. risk pregnancies, sure. but they, at, back then they were very much looking at possibilities of Down syndrome, but that's part of my story because my mom has health anxiety herself. So when she so there was even found more than. out she was pregnant with me at 42, with the doctors actually looking her in the face and saying, hey, there could be something wrong with your child. Just what she needed to hear my sister, with someone that already has anxiety. My sister was chronically ill. So it was just whole, like, kind of just bubbling circumstance oh. of anxiety brewing upon my arrival. So when I say my whole childhood was painted with this underlying wow. anxiety, it was never talked about. Of course, no, no name was ever given it, you know, and even if it was normal, it's normal. It was just a normal fight or flight. And that kind of anxious, always something meant always something is actually a mantra in my family. <laughs> that kind of mentality wow. really does illustrate, I think, the more extreme version of living in that fight or flight. I mean, wow. that was real for us. Wow. Like, it did feel like it was always now just looking back sure right? from a distance i'm like well you know like the, the the grass not getting cut to your liking doesn't feel like always something to me right now but it did it did there's such a connection between you know when i just don't have the resources and i'm chronically in that fight or flight everything does feel like always something was your dad did your dad have anxiety too my dad didn't he was a he's i i kind of he he's a bit on the periphery if I were to paint like a he's a bit passive he is and he isn't but he wouldn't have had anxiety but mm. he was very much enmeshed or really interconnected with my mom and with hers so I I say or the way I describe it I don't know if the listeners have ever heard of a concept called codependency or enmeshed relationships I think people have heard of codependency but even I'm just learning what it is because mm -hmm. it's you know the, the the explanation of it which yeah please explain codependency yeah I, I mean that's the first thing that came to mind when I heard you start talking about your dad when exactly he's that's... very passive he was in some way supportive almost mm -hmm. and enabling yes 100 those are those are definitely words and a lot of times so listeners might have heard codependency referenced in terms of substance use or addiction. A lot of times okay. you'll hear yeah. about mm -hmm. the codependent personality that often then manifests in that. I, I believe that actually more of us than, than not sit on the more codependent end of a spectrum. If you would have asked me a decade ago, though, Danica, if I was codependent, I would have looked at you, laughed, said, <laughs> Not at all. Definitely Nothing's not. Wrong I knew me. what codependency was a decade ago. I just didn't know how that it applied to me. So when I talk about it now, I talk about a much more expanded definition of it. Because like mm. I said, I do believe a lot of us are struggling mm. with that in our relationships mm. for a lot of different reasons. Essentially what it is, though, is a blurring. So I'm a person. If we think about me with like a little you know, kind of cell membrane around, a circle around yeah. me, right? So to, to be in a healthy relationship, I believe in interdependence. So there is a space, like we, we are social creatures. We benefit from relationships. Relating with others, help even just from division of labor to stress reduction, we need relationships. But to have the healthiest relationship, we need that barrier where I can still ma maintain a sense of self that's Nicole's, separate from Danica's, if we were in whatever. Right. This is professional mm -hmm. relationships, friendships, personal mm -hmm. relationships of all kinds, romantic relationships, parental relationships. I The relationship is only as successful, I think, as we can have that separation where I can make, whether it's just my choices about what I want to do for any day, and this might sound silly, but it's a lot of us that don't know how we want to spend our time and maybe look to someone else or worry about the effects of how I want to spend my time, how that would affect someone else so like sure. if i have a partner right i feel like yeah. i always have to check in well what are we doing saturday partner yeah. instead of well saturday i want to do this and it's okay partner if you don't want to do this with me so it can be anything from behaviors like what i want to do how i want to spend my time to thoughts right a separation where i can allow you to have separate beliefs i can have separate beliefs a lot of times families this is where this originates my mm -hmm. family we had mantras we had things that the laperas believed this is what we believed as a unit with no space for, well, maybe Nicole or, you know, my sister over here yeah. believes differently. Huh. And then feelings. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the area where when I said that catch all, we all are a little codependent. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us connect our feelings with someone else's. Meaning I, it's like I, I talk about it like a roller coaster 
right? So where I'm reacting emotionally to the emotions everyone else is having in the world, to what they think of me. So that's another barrier that we want to put into place where I can have my feelings because we're all different. Yeah. Things are going to affect me differently than they affect you. And again, back to that healthy relationship, I think there needs to be space where I can have feelings that might be separate from other people's and where I don't gain my value based on how I feel about myself, based on other people. Right. So for all of these reasons, my family very much looked like a, a system that just, whether it was what we were doing. You we were all in the bubble. We tended to do it. We, we, I joke. I say we all like going, I mean, now looking back, that 20-year-old me that would have huh, laughed about codependency. I mean, we practically come out of a clown car sometimes, Danica. We like, we, I call it squad life. Like we, we go a lot of, we, historically, we went a lot of places together. We spent a lot of time together as a family. Yeah. Then there was that group think in terms of belief. Yeah, of course. And then for my family, it was, this is where my dad comes in. The emotional climate really orbited around my mom. And when my mom was in, you know, when everything was positive with mom, mainly when she was healthy and like up and walking and, you know, of the family, we all felt good. But when mom wasn't, or when mom was in a bad mood, the hmm. whole family felt bad. So that's what I was describing in terms of the emotions. So mm -hmm. our emotions really orbited around my mom's and my dad got really connected. So it became my mom and my dad. My dad really just serving my mom in terms of making sure that my mom was okay. And he defended her? So that the family Did he defend was her okay. too then? Was that He didn't part of defend. It? This is where the passivity came in. Okay. So when she would do things that I don't even know what he, I guess sometimes I do know. My mom likes to, when she's upset, ice, not speak. I call it icing. Yeah. So there have been, this is the more extreme version of this too. And this didn't happen often, but when it would happen, this is where my dad's passivity comes in. I don't know if he would directly tell me he wasn't into my mom's icing. So say I was the one who was being iced, which I have been. So he wouldn't directly say, hey, Nicole, like, I don't really agree that mom's doing that. So, but indirectly, I don't think he agreed. However, he would maybe... <laughs> And he would actually not say anything to my mom. So he would A, allow it. Not that I, you right. know, not that he can really change someone or not. I don't believe one can change anyone, but he would allow it. He would like indirectly participate in that way. And I don't think this ever happened with me, but my sister has memories of their, my, my dad would even go as far as to pass notes. You know, if my mom like wanted to pass a note to someone who, with whom she was not speaking, <laughs> she my really, dad really was would, icing. <laughs> would be Whoa. the note passer. So that's what I mean when I say the passive. So he was like condoning it, literally passing in a way, and literally <laughs> passing notes. So very interesting. Wow. Uh, so that's that's how it remained until I became conscious enough to look at that and to understand that maybe that didn't that wasn't the healthiest and that didn't allow for freedom and. I was always the one that was a little bit on that outer orbit, challenging them with how I looked and what I said and what I wanted to do. And so, thoughts. But I was always kept within an orbit, right? I was never ah. fully released to be, you know, kind of separate entirely. So did the dark night of the soul come while you were in the orbit so or was it after? The dark night of the soul did come when I was in the orbit. So once And maybe dark night of the soul we should explain what that is Absolutely. too because these are all things that when you're integrated into the world of spirituality and holistic perspectives and woo woo as some would call like you've heard of all these things but even then sometimes it's hard to know really really what that means but for a lot of people they maybe have never heard of what this yeah. is and so this isn't an this isn't necessarily an expression this is um an experience experience 100 100 so, so what is it what it is is essentially a lot of people kind of connected to actually the soul and the soul speaking and the soul, you know, if, if you are of the belief that humans are gifted with a mind, body, and a soul, it's this idea that we are something that's beyond just our physical presence and the thoughts that we have in our head, that there's a, an essence that's us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what's, what it is described as is a series of symptoms. I'll tell you what mine ended up evolving into, but it's a series of symptoms that are really connected to that some people will say it's your soul, your soul screaming out, mm -hmm. just an imbalance mm -hmm. where there's a lack of, I think of it, about it like this, a lack of alignment mm -hmm. in one or more areas of your life. Mm -hmm. So my normal, like I said, was, was anxiety, was this, was this gastro stuff that came along with it. I had some beautiful panic attacks, very connected to my family system, mm -hmm. trudging along, having a practice. And then very gradually, really see, like physical symptoms started to creep in even more. I started to faint. I had never wow. fainted before. Um, I started, I lost, I would lose the train of my thinking mid-sentence. It happened once with a, with a client sitting across from me. 
could not, I mean, we all lose our train of thought. Oh, and I can like, I can, I'm very gifted at talking my way back to something that's a semblance so anyway, of, you know, that, that I can like get, like I was saying, yeah, I could get through <laughs> or like kind of dance my way around a lost train of thought. In this moment, it was actually, it almost felt, it's so indescribable. Like my brain just went, shut off, went, went blank and someone was sitting in front of me. So I had to acknowledge to the person like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, and I got that, that one really spooked me a little bit. And then that became something that was happening a lot. I was forgetting names. So I had all of this cognitive stuff. So when I said I was scared, I was of course convinced that something in my my brain. I have a tumor. Ha- yeah, this this is the thing that I've been waiting for all along. Here, I mean, how could it not be? Now I'm actually like falling Sickness down. I'm part of your my world. Head. I'm like, I'm like, all this cognitive stuff's happening. So that's when I went on my whole journey of research, and in that, I came to discover this whole world. So I, I came to realize that for my dark night of the soul, those symptoms, the top level, were related to physiological imbalances. Just lifestyle choices that I was making, even though I thought I was making very well-intentioned, I was trying to make healthier choices in my life. There was a lot of misinformation. There was just a lot of ways that I didn't really fully understand nutrition and the importance of sleep and, you know, kind of all of the body stuff. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. So my dark night of the soul, the physical symptoms were related to that physiological imbalances. So in my journey, I discovered all of these lifestyle changes that I wanted to make. I also came to realize that part of my dark night of the soul was just that that imbalance in my relationships. Because I was so codependent, I had developed a habit, a lifelong habit up until that point, of putting everyone else and their wants and their needs before me. Because remember, if mom's happy, I get to be happy. Mm-hmm. So I just transferred that into all my relationships. Of course. Yeah. If my friend's happy, I'm happy. If my partner's happy, I'm happy. Yeah. If my colleague's happy, I'm happy. If everyone's happy, I'm happy. But I never really asked myself, Mm-hmm. what I needed in those moments first. Mm-hmm. So that led to a lot of imbalanced behaviors, things that I was doing for other people, yeah. quite literally, at the expense of myself. You can never rely on somebody else to make you happy 100% of the time. You can't do it at all. It's, you know, and it actually is really close. toxic for relationships because before you know it, if I show up for you time and time and time again, Danica, there's going to come a point somewhere down the line where I'm mad at you, not me. I get mad at you for not giving back to me, but... Yeah. I have to look at the condition that I yeah. set up. I never asked you to. I never requested you to. I yeah. never said no when I needed to say no. Yeah. But what it looks like is resentment. I get mad at you and then our relationship could quite literally come to an end because that's typically what happens. Yeah. So it's impossible. No one can make you happy. And it really does kill kill relationships. And then the soul piece of my dark night of the soul was really coming to the realization that I was living out of alignment, that the things that I was prophesizing and the way I was teaching and thinking about myself and others mm-hmm. in the world just wasn't connected with, because even in those moments, there was many times where I was doing myself a disservice by not speaking my truth, my mm. soul truth. So before you that know it, all of these imbalances led to huh. quite literally. So that would happen within your practice. All the time, within so everything. So things that you weren't, things that you might have wanted to say that you didn't say? Looked more like that, yeah. I would never speak right. mistruths, but, right, but I like, would leave it out. Leave it out, not be as direct, mm. you know, to confront mm. something that I maybe knew uh, was there. Huh. Uh, and then at the end, as I, so I continued to practice doing just my, I had my practice. So I continued yeah. with my practice as I was learning all this. So then it started to look like, wow, now I know all of these other truths that I'm not. And and every now and again, I would try to share it with some of my clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't that I was withholding it, but the conversation that I had professionally with myself was I set up an arrangement with these people to do this type of work. That was the contract, essentially. Yeah. So yeah. I would try with the clients that I thought might yeah. be open to, hey, nutrition matters or, hey, sleep matters. And some of them, we evolved the practice together. And I would talk about these truths that I was now gaining and living mm-hmm. and healing with. But I couldn't do that with all of my clients. So the ones that I didn't, it did feel like I was living this double life. Sure. Like it wasn't I would part come of that in. box. It wasn't yeah. part of that box. I would talk to you. I would just support you along the way. And really, I knew all of this other stuff stuff that might also be helpful Hmm. so it felt like that was a difficult I think kind of segue portion where I was trying to navigate because financially I had I had to keep my practice going there was just no other option so trying to navigate that Hmm. transition period was also another you didn't have 1.7 million followers on Instagram I did not I did not but that was a big that was that was incredibly helpful being able to 
to share on Instagram and wow. see the resonance. So I had that. Were you happening. sharing while you were still so practicing? So what I did was, oh, very interesting. I made the decision to go on Instagram huh. as an outlet to make to, for two sure. things: to speak my truth, to have an area where I could start to say these things that I was learning. So mm-hmm. that helped relieve some of it. So that was helpful. And another one was I'd gotten to the part of my healing that I think is also part of Dark Night of the Soul which I was so lonely. I was feeling so isolated. I was making all these choices and having all these awarenesses and reorganizing so many long-term relationships. And I was feeling really isolated about around people who got me. I wasn't feeling like I had people who were understanding exactly maybe what I'd been through or where I was going. So that was a big motivator too. Because your new life's going to cost your old one. Yes. And that takes time. And that was really, yeah. So I think a lot of us, when we start to, come to these awarenesses and do the work of healing. And I talk about this a lot because I think people, it's its hard, it's isolating, it feels lonely. How how long did Dark Night of the Soul last for you or is it still going? I, I know it can be a long process. Uh, I would say that the, probably about two years was, a, was the deepest part of it mm-hmm. with the increase in those physical symptoms leading to that kind of apex of it. Mm-hmm. And then even through the process of healing, a lot of it was coming up and releasing. So how did you, I'm gonna just call it like get out. I mean, just from the family dynamic, the, yeah. the, the norm, like how did you break out of that cycle? Absolutely. So when I first I did the research and I armed myself with the changes that I was interested in making, and then I did what I profess everyone should do, which is I took them gradually. I talk a lot about small daily promises. So, mm-hmm. cause change is hard. There's mm-hmm. a lot of reasons why in our, in our brain, oh, our yeah. mental structure, the mind, the subconscious in particular, yeah. if you follow me, I'm all, cause I, Hormones, I, want norm- patterns. I want to normalize that too though, because yeah. I think a lot of us and I was who are really hard on ourselves. Yeah. Why can't we change? You know, why can't we do these things that by now we know are so yeah. good for us? Like I know it. I, why can't I why break can't these I do habits? It? And there's a real reason why, cause it's hard. Cause we're all fighting that kind of reflex that we all have, that desire to be in the familiar. Even if the familiar logically isn't gonna better our life, whether it's our familiar habits or our familiar thoughts, we just like that it's familiar. Our our subconscious believes it's safe. Well, there's a whole hormonal cycle that happens with Mm -hmm. familiar uh, responses and living your life a certain way. There's like hormonal, uh, it's like you're programmed to crave that hormone that gets yes. produced every time there's a drama or yeah. a sadness or whatever your cycle is. Yeah. Is that right? 100%. I couldn't. And I call this the process of emotional addiction. Mm-hmm. So we get so, so I'll just use my example. because now You know, a bit of my story, chaos and stress. That's, those are the two words I said more often than not when sharing my history, right? There's hormones connected with that cortisol and adrenaline. So because I got so, my body, so thoughts, right? I'm stressed, the family crisis of the minute, whatever it was, caused a stressful thought, caused a stress response in my body, even at my nervous system level. So cortisol and adrenaline are the hormones that are dispatched through my body to get Mm -hmm. my body ready to fight or flee, right? Mm Because my body actually thinks in that moment that the the lack of lawn care is a threat. I mean, this is evolutionary based. So my body's going to gear me up to fight the threat. So mm-hmm. these hormones cur- careen through my body. They cause all these changes. Mm-hmm. And then my nervous system snaps over into the sympathetic. So I'm having, you know, my body is getting ready to fight this thing. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to fight, right? But that becomes my cycle. If that happens frequently enough. Before I know it, my baseline, my body memorizes that zone. That's mm-hmm. all, that's how it feels familiar. So if you would have heard me talk, up until more recently where I feel like I do live in peace, all I would say I want it on this planet here is peace. I just want peace. I want peace and freedom. Those are the two words that I would always talk about. And the most interesting thing I started to observe when I had what one might think would be a peaceful day or afternoon or vacation, there was something so uncomfortable about it. Early on. Or my whole life. Or until whole I, life. Now I can embody peace. I can sit in peace. So what this looked like for me, I used to call it my, my it's an agitation. So Mayan, I, w- I would call it my oh. tick. I would start to, so I was laying, lounging, right? All Saturday, I have nothing to do. Peace, one might call it. I was so uncomfortable without that stimulation. Because it wasn't familiar. Because it wasn't familiar. So peace felt crazy, uncom- uncomfortable, foreign. So one of two things would happen. I would either feel like I had all this energy that I would, I call it tick, I would clean, I would make, I would busy myself throughout the You're day. You're describing me right now. To try to get my energy out, or I would poke at, I, I, 
if I was in a relationship, I would try to find an interpersonal stress that I could engage with oh. to remove myself from that unfamiliar piece back to what I was used to stress. So now I have something to worry about. God. I mean, honestly, I... I that you're describing me and now I can look at it from like a an esoteric perspective of astrology or something like that about being a fire sign and an Aries and all I can look at it from mm -hmm. that way and see the energy and needing to move it but I have I can't sit around like I feel and I know part of it like part of it I'm aware that as I was like growing up I wasn't allowed to do nothing like I had to wake up early. I had to accomplish mm -hmm. something. I had to do something. It was rewards for doing something. Yeah. And, but relaxing and doing nothing, I either feel lazy or boring. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm by myself, I could, I feel lazy. If I'm with someone else, I feel boring or lazy, mm -hmm. like, but boring. I'm like, oh, don't, should we go for a walk? Should we do something? And it is, it's almost yeah. like a nervous tick. Like mm -hmm. I'm unable to deregulate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a, a running joke in my family my middle name Shit. actually was nicole i'm bored so it wasn't that i was boring but i would always as a child i'm bored play with me were my favorite two lines and that was that underlying so agitation that i didn't know what it was there's still and this is different conversation that i believe or i mean i know our bodies are energy i believe we need to move our bodies and discharge yeah. energy yeah. to maintain that equilibrium. So it's not to say Don't sometimes do anything. when I'm laying, you know, my body is actually saying, Nicole, there's energy here that I would like to be moved around. So go take that walk or go yeah. clean or go, you know, yeah. do the thing. Yeah. Um, so it's different. However, I'm saying I can't ever do it. Like but it never yeah, really feels good. If it's hard. Then and it's that's why I know because I should be able to relax sometimes, right? Yeah. But I really feel like. A lot of things it could be. It could be hmm. just that range of normal, familiar Sometimes in stopping, the deeper stuff comes up. We're met mm -hmm. with ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. And yeah. I think this is epidemic level. Yeah. Like a lot of us can't stop. Like, we have a culture of busyness. We, yeah. you know, we value productivity and the markings of never sleeping, doing all the things. Um, and it's no coincidence. Mm. I think a lot of us are chasing those things because we feel better mm -hmm. than we feel when we're just stopped. Because mm -hmm. then we're just with ourselves, and we don't have all the distractions mm. in place. So... We allow to come up maybe some of the deeper stuff that yeah. we'd rather not yeah. look at. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted in my own oh shit moment. But um, as I am a very hard worker on myself, but more to go. Um, so, but I want to get, get to this because I think that a lot of people can relate. I know a lot of people can relate, but there's always that moment there that you have to break free. You have to sever ties. You have to create boundaries there has mm -hmm. to be you've talked a lot about boundaries and you know how did that was there like a a, a one day where you sat down with your family or was mm -hmm. this a was this a progressive thing that happened over mm -hmm. time where contact was reduced but like how did you get to the point where you finally felt like i'm free mm -hmm. so it was once i started making those small daily lifestyle changes that I did that and I was still having a relationship with my family. So that took a couple months to get my body stabilized. So mm -hmm. I addressed kind of the physical person first. And I think that's necessary because like I was saying, with those, those imbalances, I was doing a lot of polyvagal work, which is, so we have a nerve and it, to keep it really short and simple. So when we're in fight or flight, when we're stressed, when we're panicked, when we have PTSD, when we're just under low level, you know, kind of stress, our, our nervous system is in that sympathetic state. The alternate nervous system, again, this is a very loose description, is called the parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a nerve, it's called the, the vagal nerve, the vagus nerve, that kind of helps us. We're supposed, a healthy tone is when we can use both of our nervous systems when necessary. When we're in a peaceful state, we're in our parasympathetic and we're calm and all of our body systems are in the calm state. We can sleep, we're digesting. And then we shift over because we do need our sympathetic nervous sure. system when we need it. And then we go back very, you know, seamlessly. So I was doing a lot of vagus work because when you are stuck, as a lot of us are, we can be stuck in sympathetic and fight or flight like I was with stress and anxiety and panic. We can also be stuck in parasympathetic, which looks a little more like what we think of when we think of depression. Mm. My mood is low. Okay. I have no interest. I'm almost so off. I'm so okay. turned off. Think about it, right? I'm on. I'm 
yep. I'm anxious, I'm stressed, yeah. I'm on the end The of lion's going to eat me, I better keep yes, going. Yes, quite literally. And now I'm so, I have no energy, no interest, I'm in bed all day. So mm-hmm. some, we can get stuck. Again, mm-hmm. I'm using really simplified mm-hmm. language. Mm-hmm. We can get stuck in either of those. So the Vegas, we really want to tone. So I was doing the physiological lifestyle work. I was yep. changing what I ate, yep. sleeping, et cetera. And I was doing the polyvagal work. And then I started to gain some traction. My, I started to feel balanced. I started to have so the polyvagal is what then? It's a so polyvagal work is connected to the vagus nerve. So it looks like breath work, chanting. Oh, okay. okay, thank so you. So we can actually manually stimulate our okay. vagus nerve. There's okay. there's medical equipment out there that they can okay. do it, but the beautiful part of it is we can yeah. do it too. Okay. And the quick and easies that I always reference is is just a breath work practice. Okay. A particular it, way of it's actually a deep belly breath is our quickest way in. So if so, we learn how to breathe. So if anyone listening or want yeah. to put a hand on our chest and a yep. hand on our belly, yep. most of the listeners will probably notice that you're breathing very shallow from your chest. Uh-huh. That is a marker of that sympathetic nervous system in and of okay. itself. Because think about it, when we're running yeah. from a predator, we're not taking those nice deep belly breaths. We're, we're yeah. panting. We're running. You're, you're tense. You're tense. So the, there's a, a many different breathwork practices that sure. stimulate the sure. vagus, but the belly one is something okay. you can do all day. So I mean, just deep I could breath just into practice. your belly, just in so through your So it might look How weird. Look? I put hand on my belly to get yep. started. So I have I carry some of my emotions in my posture. So others listening might also have a hard time doing this. I started mm-hmm. by laying down. So I would lay down as part of my morning routine and just give myself, put my hand on my belly to make sure I was breathing into the belly and just five belly breaths with enough practice. Then that's a breathing that you can do all day long. So then I continued to build on that. So all day I would just practice when I remembered, of course, that wasn't natural. Sure. And now I've retrained my whole nervous system that I'm pretty much a belly breather. And I can catch myself now when one of two things, when I either moved up to my chest or when I hold my breath. (gasps) What a great indicator. Because I notice I hold my breath. And listeners out there would experiment. Observe how you breathe. We don't, I mean, breathing is something that our body does for us. Thank you, body. But we also can consciously attend to it. And I notice that when I'm feeling stressed, I will hold my breath. Not in like a, you know, like I'm holding Mm -hmm. my breath, but in almost a unknown, like it's just a behind the Hmm. scenes, like I'm not really breathing. So even sometimes just the intention to take a deep Hmm. breath. We but start off like that as babies, right? Don't babies all belly, belly breathing? breathing? Yeah. Anyone has yeah. an infant out there, look at your little infant and you'll see yeah. the belly. It's all. And then just over time, we all just gradually evolve up to that chest. Mm. So we really want to push our breath down to if our I look belly. weird over here. It's because I'm going to focus on my and belly it could breathing. Go, it could go a long way. <laughs> and then way. I'm just going to fall asleep right here. Yeah. Right? It could go a long way. Yeah. I mean, this is really important too for just emotional regulation because our, our body reacts. So when we're in a, a difficult conversation. Mm-hmm. Right. If I don't like what you're saying to me, sure. so as not to react like I don't want to, if I yeah. can just deploy some of that belly breathing, oh. I mean, it's not going to take it all away, sure. but it could give us a, a little bit of control. Whereas I would just have maybe lost control emotionally Take the edge off. or yeah, before. So I spent a lot of time doing both of those things, getting my body in order. Yeah. And then my mind started to clear. I had, I had at that point developed a daily meditation practice. I think it's Good incredibly important to be conscious to observe. How long? Like, let's be realistic. Start with one minute. Great. Thank Quite you. Quite literally. It's just every day. Small. When I say small daily promise, I mean small because the consistency yep. is what's important. I don't even think you need to. So what my daily meditation practice now looks like, I meditate for around 10 to 20 minutes, depending on if I do a guided one or if I'm just sitting every day. Maybe some days not even up to 10. You know, it depends. Yeah. Um, what I believe is most important. So when we're meditating, we're developing a new relationship with our thinking mind. Most of us spend too much time in our thoughts. We allow our thoughts to rule our life. We think our thoughts are us. We think they're our intuition speaking to us. Mm. Really, that's the house of all that conditioning, (laughs) all the things that aren't helpful Mm -hmm. to us. So what I believe is most important is practicing consciousness all day long. So Instead of building up to even an hour, some people will. I mean, I was actually just watching a really inspiring documentary um, of someone who meditates for an hour each day. And I I thought I might try that. That's not necessary. What is more important, in my opinion, is consciously living your day, is being able to observe yourself, your thoughts, having that separation, really tuning into that that soul or whatever you want to call it, that you that's not your thinking mind. I assure you, yeah. none of us are our thinking well, you, mind. Well, you've said that one of the things that you, the, what you really hope people take away from your work is that for people to become aware of the fact that you are not who you think you are. Yes. 
So what do you mean by that? Yeah, you're not. I mean, we have all of or these Or you're not ideas. what you think you are. Yeah, we have all... Who, who do we think we are, right? Yeah. We think we are our habits, the things we do. Our and name. This is a, if you, yeah, if you describe, if you our ask body. people, you'll see the, right? We think we're the things we do. Maybe the things we do with our body, how our body looks. Sure. Right? We sure. think... We think beliefs about ourselves, some of which we were told, you know, oh, you're shy. Oh, you're outgoing. Mm. Oh, this is who you are. This is, we think the thoughts that we rehearse are. We tend to, we're so habitual. We're habitual in our behaviors. Yeah. We're habitual in our thoughts. If you start to tune in and be conscious and observe your thoughts, most of us will see that they're very, I call them narratives because they're repetitive. Yeah. They're yeah. the same story. Yeah. Whether it's the story I'm telling me about myself, yeah. about my relationships, my place in the world, other people. Story, story, story. So we, and we think we're the feelings that we're used to having. But if we look back at the development of all of this, we are, we are that awareness. That's what we will remain. However, over time, right, we've stored all of this other crap. All of the, our habits have been stored. Because that's what we were taught. We were mm-hmm. taught that's how you take care of your body or that's what you do in the morning or that's not what you do in the morning. We have been rehearsing thoughts for so long that now they're beliefs. That's who we think we are. We have a story essentially that lives in our mind that that's who we think we are. And I am now a liver of the experience of that's not who we are. We are the awareness. And while those are conditioned, I use the word conditioning a lot, those are conditioned patterns, Mm -hmm. we can uncondition ourselves and Mm -hmm. we can give ourselves freedom Mm -hmm. to make new choices. So Mm -hmm. when I started to practice that daily, this is where the family stuff really started to get involved in my healing. As I started to observe myself and watch the thoughts I was having when I'm around my family, the thoughts about my family in general, thoughts that were coloring my other relationships that were connected to my family. As I started to observe how I felt around my family and other people that I was relating to. How do you feel when you're, uh, when you're going to hang out with this person? How do you feel when you're hanging out with this, these people? How do you feel when you leave these people? And so I started to observe, that's when I really had the reckoning. Because up until this point, I was healing. My family was in my life. Like, I didn't really consider. My partner was starting to drop very kindly and lovingly some of her observations that she was gathering along the way, but not pushing. And I was very defensive. Mm-hmm. No, my family is not like that. I don't know what mm-hmm. you're talking about. That mm-hmm. is not They're fine. the case. You know, you are an unloving and not supportive partner. Don't ever say that again. It's very I hard mean, to talk about someone else's family. Seriousness, There's a lot of defensiveness, defensiveness that comes up. Sure. I'm joking now, but that's, oh, I, totally I will different. readily admit I was not welcoming. I did that inf- too. Information. I did not want to hear it. I did not like it. And I put her, I cast her as doing something wrong by even trying to tell me these things. I wasn't ready is mm-hmm. the point. So. As I continued, though, so then I was like, okay, well, she's saying it. Let me just look. Let me just see for myself. What does that look like? What is when you say you would observe how you felt before, you observe how you feel during, you observe how you feel after. This is like the call to action now. That's one thing to think it, right? But then you go do it and you're like, oh, I don't know. It seemed fine. So t- what can someone do to, to, to really understand how they felt and observe mm-hmm. themselves before, during, and after. What is the technique? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it all begins with the body. First, and this doesn't just have, so listener, oh, I'm going to go do this tomorrow. Probably not. Because two things will have to happen first. You have to practice the skill of observe, observing, right? Of, of watching yourself in this. Okay. I kind of hold my hand up. Like I'm kind of hovering above. Yeah. We can do that. I yeah. Mean, we have a really amazing mind we are all gifted with. Agreed. But you have to practice that, yeah. right? Otherwise, I'm just reacting to life as it's thrown at yeah. me. So I have to be able to hear what you're saying, right? And to also observe that what you're saying is making me think this thing and feel this thing. So we have to be able to kind of have that look. So that's a skill that has, and that's not going to happen when you're walking into an uncomfortable situation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is just a primer that I want to say for all of these tools. We need them when we need them, but... To use them effectively when we need them, we have to start practicing them when it's not as hard. So I just practiced observing myself all of the time, Mm. knowing that when I'm going back to my family of origin and the feelings that are connected there are going to get, you know, kind of touched and like Mm -hmm. triggered, if Mm -hmm. you will, that it's going to be harder for me to do this because I probably will go back into the same thing I always do, which is cope and tell myself it's fine. Yeah. And not feel. And not feel I'm like, oh, yeah, it just seemed normal. It's fine. Disconnect myself. Yep. And that was a big part of my past and now my future journey in healing is so I was talking earlier and I, I alluded and I used language of lacking a memory. So part of my story is because I was so overwhelmed by 
anxiety and stress that was too much for me as a child. And I didn't have the caregivers in place to help me. So when, when you have a child, big feelings are happening. So a parent or a caregiver has to help that child understand what's happening and learn to navigate their yeah. emotions. Yeah. So without that, in absence of that, because I was so overwhelmed, the gift of our, our mind is that it will never let us be overwhelmed. Yeah. It will find a way to cope. Because yeah, the, the ego does a good job at that. I mean, don't be mad at the to. ego. It does a good job of protecting we you. We need the ego. But it's only looking at the very moment you're in. 100%. And Not I tomorrow. will always, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of the ego. It's necessary. Yeah. It protected us. It did what we needed it to do. Yeah. Um, so at the time, the adaptation that I made was to do what is called dissociating, which is detaching, mm. which is, I call it my spaceship. I used to go away in. What? And it was as if, and on the outside, you would never know. Yeah. I would appear here. I could have a full conversation with really? you. But in terms of attachment to my body, I wasn't in my body. I wasn't connected. I couldn't tell you how my body even like physiologically felt, let alone the emotions sure. that I was having, but I can navigate the situation. And that was a form of protection. So I was oh. up on my spaceship oh. hovering safely above mm -hmm. the things that were too difficult mm. for me to feel. You removed every last bit of yourself I removed other everything. than the one that just was there. Whatever and could power it out. And I got, this is where I got really good. This is where mm. this codependency started at showing up the way you needed me to. Because I was so attuned to you to fit in, to preserve the love from you. And th this you, whether it's my mom or my friend at school or, you know, the boss that I would later have, that was important. So because I was, myself wasn't there, I was fully available to you. And I got really good at that. So I could tell exactly, I could feel you, I could know what people wanted, what they needed from me in the moment, and that's that codependency I was talking about earlier. So I showed up in service like shape -shifting almost. of other people, of other people, of other people, time and time and time again. So how did you um how did you learn? How did you figure out who you were? It's it's a journey in progress. So it's this goes job. back to so grounding myself. So when I when I talk, and I talk about this often. I talk about having no memories. And a lot of the, the reason I have no memories is because I wasn't connected enough in <laughs> those moments to put the memory in. Huh. And the big aha yeah. for me, or a big aha I relate for to me, that. because I was convinced, Annika, that I must have, this was back to this brain issue that I was just waiting to descend upon me. I knew I didn't have memories for some time. Probably in my 20s, I started to hear other people talk about their childhood in ways that I didn't know what mine was like. Yeah. So I started to kind of realize that my autobiographical story was a little bit absent compared You're like, to- like, I'm missing the first four chapters. Most people around me, yeah. <laughs> I, I, and so that, but I thought it was something in my brain that was wrong with me. Oh, it must be something that's like just off in my brain. So long story short, I start talking about that online when I go online and I start to realize that talk about being connected, disconnected from our authentic self, so many of us lack memories in different extremes, but because they're so disconnected. So huh. as I started to uh. come to that awareness uh. and realize that I had removed myself from all of my relationships, beginning with my family of origin, I was not connected to my body in any way. Then I started to practice reconnecting with my body and breaking that habit of dissociating was so incredibly difficult. And that looked like the tool that I always talk about using, because we all have them, is our senses. So anything, when you are using something sensory, when I'm seeing, when I'm smelling, when I'm tasting, when I'm hearing, they are only active in the present moment where the thing, the sensory yeah. item yeah. is yeah. per se, right? Mm -hmm. So using those tools as attention hooks or those, those senses, so just literally focusing on what am I seeing in this moment? Can I feel my body in this chair, right? Breathing. Mm. Can I focus my attention back into my body and the, through the act of breathing? Mm. That those are grounding techniques. I just, I mean, I literally just felt so my butt in the chair, and Look. I just went. And here you are. And I honestly just felt my like shoulders drop. I'm like, oh. there you are. Yeah. Oh, that feels and, good. Yeah. And a lot of us it's like aren't presence spending time there. So that's where oh, it's great presence tip. begins and grounding. It's through those. So that's how I broke my habit of dissociation. I came back down. So. 
how do I tune in? Came back down from your spaceship. Down, I landed my spaceship. It's now been retired. (laughs) I've given it away to the next person. Yeah, for the time being. You haven't seen the spaceship in a while. I have not seen the spaceship. It's been a minute. It's funny though. I have the spaceship emoji. Uh, I just saw it on my phone for the first time. I was like, oh damn, where was this when I needed it? I'm gonna store your phone with a spaceship. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna perpetuate (laughs) that that cycle. No spaceship spaceship. anymore. Um, But so to to answer your question, we have to be in our bodies to know how we're feeling in any moment. So the practice first is grounding yourself, is learning how to reconnect, learning how to be in your body. Mm. Some of us will find the things, like so for some of us, I'm going my ear, uh, music. Mm. Some people will find their ability to be present a little bit easier through music. Yeah. For me, it's always been nature. Yeah. When I'm in nature, that can grab yeah. my attention, allow me to be present in my body mm-hmm. in a different way. So you're going to want to, the listeners are going to want to practice being in their body yep. so that they can then practice observing how their body That's how it started for me with music feels. in nature. So yes. I listen to very Zen music in mm-hmm. nature. Mm-hmm. And then it got to the point where, yeah, but that's how it started. Yep. So, so first you're going to be in your body and then your body's going to tell you. So then what that look like for me is, okay, how do I feel when my phone buzzes and it's my sister or my mom? Or how do I feel when I know I'm going to see them this weekend? And how do I... So where are you feeling it in your body also, right? Are you feeling it in your heart? Are you feeling it in your stomach? you feeling it like, is there a gut reaction? And I would start to feel like a tension yeah and a tightness yeah just a not positive right not relaxed not relaxed there is a reaction and that happens so i like i I, i've come to now realize i'm now cultivating relationships that are much more in alignment and to have the experience of leaving someone or something and feeling light and positive was was foreign and it might be foreign to people listening because they might not have those you know, relationships or con- or environments in their life. And I know I didn't for a long time. And now that I do, it's such a contrast. It's like, oh, that's what it's like to be around someone that's in vibrational alignment with you versus, mm-hmm. oh, I'm going to the people that I really don't want to be spending sure. my time around. So as I allowed, and that was hard. Well, you just, you talked about how at first you felt lonely, right? Lonely, You're not in vibrational yeah. alignment with anyone around you. Exactly. So that you could feel the, sh- you had the shift yeah. happening in yourself, but they were still where they were at. Yes. So there was a lack of resonance with you mm-hmm. and your environment. Yeah. You can well, feel that. You feel that. But and you that can make- feel when you're in it too. Yes. Yeah. You feel it all. So I started to be aware of these feelings. And then I started to make, so this was a very gradual evolution. Then I started to to realize that I needed boundaries. So boundaries are, so back to that codependency, right? I am, there's no circle. There's no membrane around me. I needed to build one. So I needed to define limits for myself. So a lot of those limits were within my family too. So I came to the conclusion that there were certain areas that I wanted to start to pull back on whether it was how much time I was available to them or how much did you tell them that emotion I was available to them and I communicated at that time okay so it mainly so the relationship that I had the most active and the closest was, was was with my sister so she and I would have many conversations where I would first my requests were around I don't really want to talk about mom's health all the time because it started to feel like all you said that I would tell that to my sister because what I said a boundary to, to observe in our conversations were that 99% of them were about the latest Ugh. health crisis. Yeah, drama. At this point, none of which that I would even define as a crisis. This wasn't me turning my back on my mom who was, you know, this was me like, my mom has doctor's appointments almost every month, you know? So I'm not going to become upset by every doctor's appointment because there's no need. Nothing's mm. happening mm. at every doctor's appointment. They felt like there was at every doctor's appointment, but I didn't. And that's mm. where I started to define my limit. So... First, it was, I don't want to talk about mom all the time. I, and this was actually in service, so I thought, of building a deeper relationship with my sister. Sure. Right? So right. if we move mom 98% of the time, we yeah, have a lot saying. more that I could get to know you and talk to you about. Was your mom also a narcissist? I mean, was there narcissism there, yeah. so, wrapped up in it? Because yeah. then I've also heard that there's like the the another way um, – it's a, like a narcissist, um, like a committee almost, like the narcissist um, like team. Like a narcissist yeah. gets a team going. Yeah. And so too. this is another. So if. And a narcissist is. My partner. I was going to say my partner offered oh. that word narcissist. <laughs> I did not like it. Now I understand. So explain what a narcissist that that's is. That's what it is. So because I think. Because this is a tough one. It's a tough one. And I think. And I know that narcissism is getting talked about a lot now. And I think that's really helpful. Yeah. I think the type of narcissist that's being talked about is the very kind of egocentric. It's all about me. And a really direct kind of egotistical. The I think 
This yeah. is where I think ego gets a bad name too because it's not the ego that you yeah. and I were previously talking about. Yeah. But what the listeners would think of when they think of egotistical narcissists, it's all about me and I don't care who I stomp on, you know, to get what I my needs met. That's mm-hmm. the narcissist, right. I think, that mo- is most thought of when you Agreed. hear that word reference. Agree. Which is why when my partner first offered that my mom might be slightly narcissistic, I thought she was absolutely nuts because that's <laughs> not how my mom presents. Right. It's not the direct she actually is very much, her language is much more of a... Um, covert narcissist. That's the word yes, I was covert. thinking. Uh, my mom would much likely tend to say, everyone else before me. But hers is much more covert. But she would still be... So what a narcissist is, essentially, is it actually goes back to that lack of self. So it begins early on when a person from a very young age doesn't have any definition of them as a self, them as separate from someone else. So what happens is the only way that they can feel good about themselves is through others and other people in, in a way. So it, so it, it starts in a very protective developmental mechanism. And then it does look like them putting themselves first in different ways, emotionally, my yeah. emotions guide all of my well, her illness, right? Her sickness so for my is mom, that's kind what of it narcissism. Like. So it was a little bit more confusing because yeah. she wasn't running around making it about me. She was sure. actually a little more behind the scenes. It wasn't flashy. But it was covertly about her. Cause like yeah. I said, it was how is mom feeling? Yeah. How is mom? Is she physically well? Is she yeah. mentally well? Are we all yeah. happy? Or are we not happy based on based on mm-hmm. mom? But there was definitely that was right. Mm-hmm. I I'm gonna say one. something controversial, maybe now too. I believe we're all on a spectrum of yeah. of narc. I mean, I don't necessarily think it's an unhealthy thing. I would call myself slightly narcissistic. Yeah, I think we're all more on the spectrum. Some of us more extreme than others, yeah. but we are all. I mean, an ego reaction. When I'm having, mm-hmm. when I'm upset by something you say, and my upset is so big, is maybe disproportionately big for what maybe objectively happened. I'm in a narcissistic state because now my emotion has overwhelmed sure. me. I don't give a shit what you're saying or doing in that moment because it's yeah. all about me. So we all have moments of narcissism. That's what that reaction is sure. when I'm in an emotional state. It's or when a you're affecting other people state. too. Yeah. And that could look then outward. Mm-hmm. So if I kick and scream a tantrum when I'm upset, in that moment of upset, when my upset is active, I might be affecting other people negatively and I don't care. I might care later, and that's where shame, the shame cycle comes in. Mm. I feel so bad about myself because that's, that's not who I am. I didn't mean to hmm. hurt the people that I've indirectly hurt in that moment, maybe, yeah. but I couldn't see outside of myself. Did so, you go through that phase of shame and guilt? Uh, shame, I don't... I think most of the things that I am shamed about and remain shameful of, though these moments are decreasing infrequently now, are when I overreact. When I, when my core wounds, so a lot of mine, this is really prevalent in in relationships. One of my core wounds is not feeling considered, not feeling seen and heard as a separate entity as a child, right? So it comes together. So there are so many ways that I could spin a story of not being considered in my relationships. Sure. And when, especially, you know, before I've done as much work as I have now done, those would be very, very frequent, those stories. So anytime something happened in the context of a relationship where I would feel or deem that that was an example of how I wasn't considered yet again, I would feel about it and I would feel really big. I feel hurt, I feel angry. So what I would then retrospectively become shameful of is how I reacted in those those mm. moments, right? If you pour a little bit of alcohol on top of it, I've had my share of you know raging around, upset, you know, over a slight thing, and then <laughs> and then the next day I'm like, whoa, 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 like perfect storm. What did you do there? You don't even, you know, this wasn't a moment of being not considered. Right. So I and and much more infrequent now, but when I go back into that reactivity, that's something that I can. I try not yeah. to focus too much time yeah. on the beating myself up on my own critic. But that's, I think, the the only area that I would actively yeah. be dealing with kind of the shame thing. Well, it's pretty um, hard to be perfect. It's pretty so, hard to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What kind of, um, I mean, what phase are you in right now? Like, what is, what is, what are you feeling that you're working through now? I mean, you've been in, on, on this journey for a long time and you've gone through huge growth, but it never ends, no, right? So, ends. I don't know, what's, yeah, what's the current, absolutely. what's the current, current work in progress. Absolutely. So I think the current, I mean, I'm pretty consistently conscious now, which is awesome. My body feels as balanced and kind of equilibrium as I think it ever has. I feel the Venice sunshine and the beach is definitely helping compared to Philadelphia. Unbelievably helping all of my systems. (laughs) I do believe that's a part of it. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I do believe that. Mm-hmm. That's important. I've done a lot of boundary work, so I'm getting better at having boundaries, whether it's in professional or personal life. That's sure. still an area of work, though. I was going to say, is that hard? That pro- oh, it was incredibly I, 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 difficult. I agree. It's hard for me, too. Incredibly difficult. So I spent a lot of time with my family trying to navigate different versions of boundaries that I could put into place that would prevent me from feeling like I needed to go no contact. I was trying to find- I was going to say, do you talk to your family at all? I do not. So I was trying to find a workable middle and that I say would last it over a year, maybe a year and a half from the beginning where I started to put in like peel back, put in limits, put in limits, put in limits. But because again of their really a mesh system. Look, it's so much more normal than, I mean, I feel like growing up Midwest and racing NASCAR and like this war, they were like on board with the family living all together in the same house for their whole life. So that was foreign to me, but I was still engulfed in this environment of much more codependency, yeah. much more of this integrated yes. repetitious cycle of wounds and traumas that get yes. passed on and on. And it is not normal that you don't talk to your family. Like, what happened? What's going on? But as I've expanded and gone into new spaces and areas and people and thoughts and wow, you realize that it is not that uncommon. And look, boundaries are boundaries. And usually the ones that have the biggest problem with them are, 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 can be the ones closest to us. Yeah. And because you're don't, you're showing them what they need to work and on. They don't have them themselves. That's what I, my reminder to everyone who's navigating putting up new boundaries in relationships, yeah. especially in the relationships where you're getting the kickback. Because kickback happens. Sure, kickback happens for for a couple reasons. One, you, you already have a dynamic that's in place, so you have yeah. a version of expectations. If I've known you for ten years, Danica. I'm used to how you show up in this relationship yeah. and how you don't. Right. So if on year eleven you you do something different. I heard someone use this analogy and I loved it. It's like you change the dance moves in the middle of the dance, right? <laughs> yeah. So you violated my expectation. So initially, it's going to unfamiliar. There comes that word again. I'm not going to be familiar with why you're not coming when you always come. So what's going on here? Mm-hmm. That can evolve, though, into acceptance. There's also the path, though, where the reaction I'm seeing from someone else is based more in their lack of awareness of boundaries. Sure. If they don't, So I always suggest if anyone out there listening is struggling or having a negative pushback from someone in particular look at that per- from what you know of them do they have boundaries in their life and the answer probably is no so they were never yeah. taught it they were never Good mild observation it. they just don't know so i spent a lot of time trying to find a workable middle because i didn't want to have to cut off contact with my parents yeah. my family my parents are older now i mean my dad is going to be 82 my mom's going to be 80 wow. this year well, yeah you're much younger so, than your, you know your the time siblings. The, you know and i so I, it weighed on me i wanted to find a way i have a nephew that's involved in the mix mm. so part of the living together a structural difficulty with my family is they do live together. My mom, my dad, my sister, and my nephew are oh, all wow. under one roof. Yeah, there you go. So I mean, Philadelphia is not that far off of a Midwestern mentality, right? I could, I, I, I couldn't just go see my sister. Wow. My parents were there, right? Or I couldn't just go oh. see my parents. My sister was, and like I said, they're together always. So a lot of legit. But I tried. I tried. Yeah. I tried very hard because I did not want to cut off that contact. But I finally got to the place where, and I didn't know how long it was going to be. I just knew I needed to to have a little bit more space and sure. that they were allowing at this point. Because then it, even if I tried not to respond to them to put up my own version of a boundary, like, oh, I can't talk to you till Saturday, then I would get the frantic text of where are you or what happened. Okay. So, so you had to ignore that. So I would have to ignore that. Because this is also another thing that happens. Yes. Like, because while you might set the boundary, you don't, you know, you're not talking to them. They might still yes. reach out. And that can be, yes. that carrot can be a little, yes. that dangling carrot yes. can be tough. Yeah. That's what, I mean, boundaries is setting the limit communicating the limit and then maintaining the limit mm. and that's on you not yeah. on the person and yeah. so i had yeah. multiple instances of those yeah. attempted violations yeah. and then i'd ignore them and then i get told about it so long story short i made the very difficult decision to go no contact not sure for how long i would go no contact um and that really once i got over the initial like grieving of that and like whoa what's going on this is a lot for me it really freed me up energetically yeah um and it really freed me up energetically i think to go to a deeper level of yeah. healing for me but boundaries i still am challenged yep. in all my relationships to maintain my boundaries sure. to say those hard difficult no's to sure. say this doesn't work for me 
Uh, I'm presented with multiple opportunities to do that, you know, whether it's through professional world. So I practice my boundaries. I still have work to do in terms of my own ego work. You know, I still have that ego that yeah. wants to show up and tantrum or tell me, you know, stories that aren't helpful. Yeah. So I'm still, you know, kind of doing all of that work to just, and what I think ego work is, I observe that it's there, you know, thank you for being there. And then I show up in my conscious state and I get to choose. I'm yeah. the person who chooses, not my ego. And that's something I talk about too, because I think a lot of us believe that we should be able to strong arm our ego away or that it should just go away once I know it's there. And it's really about living with the fact that there might be times where these stories, older stories are coming up from my subconscious. But if I can show up as myself in that moment, as that consciousness that is me, I can choose what I do with that story. And yeah. I don't have to allow that to determine the choice that I make next. So that's that probably, too, will be a lifetime journey. There will always be a story that, you know, my little self wants to show up and tell me is the case in any given moment. I'm challenged very regularly professionally with that. You know, as my platform grows, as I get all these amazing opportunities that are presented to me, there's a very big ego tantrum that goes on in those moments that doesn't want to show up, that wants mm. me to stay small. So that's lifetime work of healing that mm. I think I'll always be doing. It's a lot of it. It's just your, a journey that your we vulnerability continue. and honesty is admirable. This Thank is not you. something that a lot of people are comfortable to talk about. And I really admire that. I also admire this new process that you've been doing for a while with your followers um, of uh, future self journaling. That's so cool. Please explain future self journaling because when I when I saw it come up, I was like, man, that's brilliant. That's awesome. I'm so happy. Yeah, that's that's been a really cool process. So in, is it a system? First off, is this something that people can sign up for it? You so, have. Yeah. You, what, what do you have available so, yes, for people absolutely. that want, to, so want more help? I'll explain what it is. And those of you who are interested, if you hop on my Instagram, that's the main hub where everything yeah. is saved. So the dot holistic dot psychologist, you'll see a link in the link in the link tree. And it might even be in my bio right now that you can sign up for my email list. Right. And then when you sign up for my email list, there'll be a I think it's a three page with two pages of prompts that you can use each day. So journaling is something I developed as I started to do research and understand the beautiful reality that our brain is what we call neuroplastic, which means it can change. So if you think that you're kind of the circuits are hardwired, yeah. they are not. Yeah. And I created, so I kind of took that reality. Another beautiful aspect of our brain is it doesn't know the difference between what is real air quotes as in objective reality that I can lay my eyes upon and or imagined. So if I close my eyes and imagine a scenario, if I imagine I'm on the beach right now, I might as well quite literally, if my body would change me, I would be, I might as well be on the beach, right? If I imagine this is the, I don't know if you're familiar with these, these studies, I think they're so fascinating. Um, they do this a lot with um, basketball, like, like sports oh, and yeah. they'll people yep. mentally rehearse, mm -hmm. yep. you know, free uh, yep. shooting foul shots, three throws. And their their percentage goes, or, on, increase, goes yep. up yep. just because From they, visualization. they could be laying on their couch visualizing it. Yep. So that's that 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 illustrates the fact that they're laying down new pathways yep. and they're imagining, but they might as well not even be imagining because they're working their muscles in a sense. Like it's real. It's so yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So what journaling is, it really harnesses that. So it's the act of, so if you get my guide, the first page really just asks you to give a thought into an area of change that you want to see happen in your life. And that can be anything. I mean, I suggest starting with one. So listeners might be like, oh, I have 20 things I want to do. Well, start with one. One small belly promise. Change is hard. Yeah. So getting clear on one area. It's important that to say that. It's really important. And because I say this too, because you, you, you don't want to address five things at once. Mm -hmm. It's going to overload you. It's going to send you into overwhelm. And it's going to mm -hmm. send you right back into those sure. familiar patterns. And you don't want to fail because that's not a, that's not a process fail. that you want to... Yes. Um, experience because yes. you don't want it to, to not be a place that you can go to for yeah. reliable, consistent growth. Yes. And you don't want to fail. And I love that you pointed that out, Danica, because most of us have spent a lifetime failing. Right. I call it self-betrayal, right? Back to why I can't change. If I've watched myself intend to do some whatever, eat healthier, whatever it is, if I intended to do that for however many years, 20 years, I'm pretty down on myself by year 21. I don't actually believe yeah. that I can eat healthy because yeah. I have it. So if I put an expectation bar up, that means tomorrow I'm gonna eat healthy and never eat unhealthy again. I mean, I might as well not bother. Yeah. I mean, talk about disappointment. I've disappointed myself for how many years and I'm gonna do it again. Yeah. So you wanna set yourself Absolutely. up to be able, even if it seems so, I mean, 
I have this, I always talk about this, this story because I have a community member. Her name is Allie and she's amazing. Her journey of, at this point, complete and utter transformation. I mean, she's, she's healing. She's her, she has MS and she has her symptoms under physically control. Physically healing. So she's physically healing. She's singing again. She was at the point where she almost couldn't use her voice oh because her God. MS symptoms were so bad. She's significantly, you know, lost weight. Not that weight is a symptom, uh, you know, a moniker of that we need to decide if we're healthy or not, right. but she's being healthy. She feels better in her body mm-hmm. is the way I could word that. She just has made incredible change that started with a glass of water. So no small promise is small. It's too small. She started wow. with the promise that I'm going to drink one glass of water at some point during my day every day. Wow. And now she's built on that. <laughs> That's include, crazy. Isn't that crazy? I talk about it all the time. So I'm so fascinated. Oh, my God. One glass of water. That's she's, like smiling once a day. You're like that. That's all. And <laughs> she noticed herself do it. She didn't minimize herself doing it. And she continued to acknowledge each and every moment she did that and the changes that came along with that. So before you knew it, she was journaling. Wow. So what journaling is once you're clear, so say it is, I want to change this one area. So I want to be, so for me, one of the big things I started to journal about was being more present in my body. Mm. I wanted to break my habit of dissociation. So mm. every day, page two, so those of you who get the guide, you'll see on page two, there's just daily prompts that will take you through. So if you want to get a physical journal, you can print out the sheets right on there, a physical journal. But the act of writing in the present tense. So if I am someone who's, present, right? So if I'm disassociated, my goal would be, I want to be present in my body. Mm -hmm. If every morning I write, I do it in the mornings. If every morning you do it anytime during the day, if every morning I write, I am present in my body. In that moment, I've told my whole body I'm present in my body because I already am present in my body and my body is registering as if that's true. So if you write in the present tense, you're using that, you know, kind of real or imagined, doesn't matter. You're You're also mentally rehearsing. So if I say that daily, now I've at least fired once the, a new a new affirmation about myself. New I am present, right? When I've to been told and heard from people how not present I am for so long and I now yeah. know myself I'm not present. So now I'm already firing up another yeah. pathway. No, I yeah. am present. And then I set the intention to check in with myself and my body and to use my breath as my point of attention to bring myself into presence. So I write that intention as part of my journaling. That's part of you know how I become present. I connect with my breath. If I do that every morning, now I've already had my mental rehearsal for the morning, so that's great. I've got my mental workout in. But calling that as an intention, I set that as my, you know, I was conscious when I was writing. I like to see what I'm writing. That helps set me up to do that through my day. Because the caveat about journaling is it's not magic. It's not a journal that I close and the sparkles come out. And you and, bury it and with I these certain rocks it enough, and you light and a candle I'm, and you know, under the full yeah, moon. Yeah, and then I'm, then I'm done. It does mm. the work for me. That's just a tool. So then yeah. that, and it might not have been every day. Right. But if I, when, as I began to do that consistently enough, I would find through the day, I noticed how not conscious I was because that was my start point. And that was the reminder. Oh, Nicole, you're, you're not on earth right now. So come back to earth. Use that breath come back into your body. And then before I knew what I was doing that one time a day, I was doing that two times a day, three, four, five. So now I'm creating that actual change in my life. So the journaling mm. is a tool that helps us create that. So daily would change. you actually um, journal situations where you were observing yourself being so very what i was doing or was journaling. how does it go past those two thoughts? So it's, it's, it's just, it's the prompts. It's setting That's the it? intention every day to do that thing. Journaling can be a really individualized process, though. Yeah. I know people. I've never been one to just free journal. I've okay. used it strategically when I was exploring different themes in my life and things sure. like that. But you could. So I have a membership. And as part of my membership, I'm experimenting with morning intention setting and then evening having the members take a check in about their day, about the areas, you know, kind of the points where they succeeded in keeping their intended mm-hmm, promise mm-hmm. and the areas where it was a bit more difficult and then what they could tweak the next day. So mm. you can evolve journal. Sure. This is really just the, when I put out things, they're, they're all of the work I should do, put it this way. My, my caveat always is it's so individualized. Yeah. Right? These are ideas. These are yeah. concepts. These are ways you could think about it. But I so strongly urge everyone to make it their own, to adapt it. So if, if you're out there and you like the idea of journaling intention, but you also want to journal a bit more free associatively and, t- and think about, you know, that, that part of your life or that struggle in your life or those victories in your life, yeah. you can add anything to it. And I say this 
globally. There's mm-hmm. no manual. So what That's exactly good Because it can be intimidating for, for people to not. And so yeah. having that permission, whether it be through journaling or meditating or however it yes. is to go one minute, one hour, one sentence, a whole book, I really don't yeah. care. Just this is a facilitation process to achieve the things that you want to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think the so beauty great. in it is, and the empowerment in it is, actually the process of making it your own. Because the whole sure. the whole conversation you and I are having is we're not actually connected to our authentic self. We're not mm. being us. And in that, not only are we not connected, a lot of us don't trust ourselves because we haven't spent much time being ourselves. Sure. Like, so even this, the most empowering part of adapting something is over time, not overnight, but rebuilding that trust that you actually, you can find your way through this. And it might not look like the way your friend is doing this, the work, but you're doing it and you're trusting the way you're doing the work. Mm. Cause I get so many questions and I get it. People asking me exactly how, what are the one, two, three, write the directions down. And I can't because my direction for whatever it is that we're talking about right. might not be exactly right. what your directions should be right. for you. So the beautiful part is learning sure. to connect with yourself and learning your way yep. through yeah. whatever it is, the heart and the healing. Yeah, and reduces failure. Yeah. You didn't not live up to something. Yeah. Um, so what would you consider uh, your greatest life lesson so far? That's a good question. What is a greatest lesson? There's so many. I mean, I think that the greatest life lesson is is that we all have it in us, everything that we need. And I'm still working to fully connect with everything that is in me. So it's a lesson in progress. But I think coming from such a, a belief set system of limitation. Um, my whole life, I told myself whether it was because of genetically what I was gifted or not gifted with, or just the conditions of my life, I had myself in the word in a box of sort, and I thought that was the box that I was gonna gonna live in. There were just certain things that were outside of my box that would always be outside of my box. And I think the greatest lesson that I'm evolving through, and will always continue, I think, to evolve through, is that there's nothing outside of that box. It's all in this box. And it's just how do I get back to it and access it and show up in it in the world? And I think that's the journey of life for most of us, for all of us. Yeah, what is the purpose? What What's do you think it? the purpose of being here is then? Yeah, I think reconnecting with that self. Really? I mean, it's all about going back. I mean, you want to say the cliche thing, but I think it's a beautiful back home, back home into you. You know, we come in this state and things happen and life happens and we beautifully adapt in all of the ways that we have to. And I think you get to possibly your dark night or all of the ways that you were being aren't serving you or causing those misalignments and possibly even scary symptoms. And then you are gifted in that breakdown with the ability to peel it all back and to return to that, that state. And some people you know, will, will be on this journey for a lifetime. Some people not, might not. And this is where it gets difficult with family and the isolation and the, vib- the alignment you're saying, the vibration. Yeah. Not everyone is gonna be on that journey. Agreed, totally. And that's a hard realization. So it's making the space for the people, you know, that are in whatever sure. version of relationship with you that they are for them to be on their journey, even if it looks different than yours. Yeah. But I think it's to return back to ourselves is the point thus well, far. I will modify you. and let you know as that changes. I it am. should. And it should. And yeah. it should be, it should be, it should, you should yes. add, be able to add to yes. it. If I'd asked you five years ago yeah. and five years ago before, you know, yes. before that, you would have had an answer for it and then you can expand and add chapters. Mm-hmm. And that's the beautiful yes. thing of life. So yes. thank you for helping walk us all home to ourselves, to our heart and to our truth, which is so much harder yes. than you would think. So much harder. So thank you. Of course. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.